You guys can probably guess why I'm making this video. With the release of The Batman recently-ish, I've been on a huge Batman kick, reading comics, watching the animated series, playing the Arkham games, and yes, watching the movies. And there have been a lot of Batman movies. In fact, there have been so many Batman movies that this video will be longer than my DCEU rankings video. So I had to limit myself to theatrically released movies. If I included every single direct-to-video Batman movie, I would actually die. Won't be including Batman adjacent movies like Catwoman or Joker either. And I won't be including Batman v Superman. One, because I already talked about that on my DCEU rankings video. Two, because I consider it to be more of a Superman movie than a Batman movie. It's a sequel to a Superman movie, the central conflict revolves around Superman and both the villains are Superman villains. And three, because I really don't want to watch that movie again. It's very bad. Anyway, let's get started. I debated a little bit whether or not to include this one since, while it was a theatrically released movie, it was a tie-in to a TV show. I was trying to decide how snobby I wanted to be. Okay, when I say debated, I mean I spent about 10 seconds thinking about it. Adam West and Burt Ward are so important to the history of Batman that of course I should include them here. These portrayals of Batman and Robin were actually kind of controversial back in the day. I know they're pretty widely beloved now, but back then they were pretty loathed by a lot of comic book fans. And yeah, if I were alive back then and this was the only image of Batman that mainstream audiences had, I probably wouldn't love it either. But looking back on it today, now that it's just part of a grand spectrum of live-action Batman interpretations, I find it absolutely delightful. I probably won't have much to say about this one because I find it hard to talk about comedies without just saying, This was funny, it made me laugh. But this movie did make me laugh a lot. The some days you just can't get rid of a bomb scene is the funniest thing ever put to film, and the running gag of Batman just automatically figuring everything out in an instant feels like a parody of Batman fans who think he can just do anything given enough prep time before those fans even existed. Also, this movie is campy, but it can be morbid sometimes too. People die, and it's hilarious. The villains are also great. I like seeing the Joker portrayed not as this ultimate edgelord society boy we know him as today, but instead as the annoying friend that nobody really likes hanging out with. Also, this suit jacket is the best live-action Riddler costume. Yeah, not much to say about this one. It's simple, it's colorful, it's funny, it's a good time. Speaking from a purely aesthetic standpoint, this is the best Batman movie. Maybe it's because my introduction to Batman was the animated series, the look of which was heavily inspired by this movie, but this is what Gotham should always be in my eyes. Perpetual night, dirty streets, and gothic architecture with buildings stretching up to the sky. The Danny Elfman theme as well is exactly what I think my ideal Batman should sound like, equal parts dark and somber as it is adventurous and triumphant. I'm just gonna come out and say it, I think Jack Nicholson as the Joker is my all-time favorite performance in a superhero movie. Yeah, yeah, Heath Ledger was nuanced, he was scary, but this Joker is one of the few comic book movie villains that I think really feels like a straight-up supervillain. Really think about it, aside from Willem Dafoe as Green Goblin, most movies choose to have their villains be more like action or thriller movie antagonists rather than comic book villains. Nicholson feels like he's just doing exactly what Cesar Romero was doing and just making the comedy behind it darker. The, my face on the one dollar bill line perfectly sums up what I love about this take on Joker. He doesn't have any grand goal, he's not trying to hold a mirror to society, he just likes fucking with people. Sure, I don't like that they made him the guy who killed Bruce's parents, but that's a pretty minor plot point in the movie anyway. I would say the weakest aspect of this movie, ironically, is Batman. Again, aesthetically I think he looks great. Maybe too much black, and it's weird that they gave feet to the Bat logo on his chest, but he's properly imposing and looks great in silhouette. Love me some big ears on a Batman. The main problem is his characterization, or lack thereof. Michael Keaton does a good job playing Bruce Wayne as a weirdo loner who's more comfortable dressing up as a bat and beating up bad guys than actually being around people, but the movie doesn't feel all that interested in exploring this. Batman as a character is pretty stagnant. The closest thing he has to an arc is learning to let people in more, and even then that's pretty much forced upon him rather than it being a choice he makes. 
But then again, I don't really go to this movie looking for deep characterization. I'm looking for stylized comic book cheese, and this Batman absolutely delivers on that front. Every time he goes into action, I'm just thinking, hell yeah, that's Batman right there. The cape, the fighting, the gadgets, and of course the iconic designs of the Batmobile and Batwing are all perfect. True, I do hate that this Batman kills people, but if the movie doesn't focus on it too much, I can partially overlook it. This movie really is just the perfect bridge between the Adam West Batman era and our more modern understanding of Batman on film. It just provides a feeling that no other Batman movie before or since has quite recaptured. It may not be my favorite Batman movie, but I love it all the same. I don't think this statement has ever been truer than right now, but they simply do not make movies like this anymore. Okay, I should say Tim Burton doesn't make movies like this anymore. This is one of the Tim Burtoniest movies Tim Burton ever made, and I mean that in the best way possible. He was kind of playing it cool with his style in his first Batman movie, but here he's completely let loose. Everything feels eerie, otherworldly, and cartoony in a way no other director could quite capture. Setting it at Christmas is also a simple but effective stylistic choice to make it stand apart even further from the last film. Yes, it's a great movie, just not a great Batman movie. Like, aesthetically, it's still kind of what I want from Batman, but any of the character stuff I enjoyed from the first movie is gone at this point. I still think it's good, Danny DeVito's Penguin is an incredibly compelling character to watch. And like, that is some of the most no-brainer casting I've ever seen, he's perfect in the role. He feels like a Tim Burton character, especially with that origin story, but he doesn't feel especially like a Batman character. A deformed baby thrown into a sewer and raised by penguins is a bit shark jumpy even by comic book standards. But Burton makes it feel completely... well, natural's not the right word, but it fits with the tone he's established. Catwoman 2, her origin isn't anything like the comics, and doesn't even really mesh well with the classic Batman mythos, but damn it, she's not entertaining. I think these two characters, mainly Penguin, are strong enough to carry entire stories on their own. Ironically, the biggest thing holding back this Batman movie is Batman. Honestly, I forgot it was a Batman movie for a little bit. He's barely a presence for about 50% of the runtime, and when he did show up, I kind of started mentally checking out and waiting for them to cut back to the Penguin. And I don't need to mention that he's even more out of character in this one. It's pretty much impossible to ignore him being a blatant murderer this time around than it was in the last movie. It makes it kind of hypocritical seeing him try to stop Catwoman from killing Shrek. Like, dude, you shove dynamite down a guy's pants. Speaking of which, it's weird that we have two villains in a row who use clowns as henchmen. The plot also feels a bit disjointed and aimless sometimes. They make a big deal about Batman thinking Penguin is lying about not knowing his parents, but they don't really do anything about it. Sure, Penguin ends up using the goodwill he has from the people of Gotham to run for mayor, but that was Shrek's idea. It wasn't part of his plan. They also devote a lot of time to Penguin's scheme to frame Batman for murdering that woman, but that doesn't really have any consequences either. But those issues still don't stop me from loving this movie. Like I said, I can watch Danny DeVito's Penguin all day. It's so disconnected from the Batman I recognize that I was able to completely separate it from the character I know and just enjoy it as a spiritual successor to Beetlejuice. It leaves me at a weird point. How do I rank this one? I love the movie, but if the purpose of this video is to rank Batman movies, then I feel like one of the criteria should be how well it represented Batman. Ultimately, I decided to rank Returns below Batman 66, even if I did enjoy this one more. Just because it's at the bottom doesn't mean I didn't like it. You'll know when we get to the ones I don't like. If you're enjoying this video and like superheroes, why not check out my comics Dark Phantom and Wonder Boy? New issues for both are released regularly for free on Webtoon. If you really like me, please consider me on Patreon. For just a dollar a month, you can get early access to comics and videos, as well as exclusive access to my podcast where I provide commentary on my comics, along with my collaborators Miki Ramirez and Tristan Dunman. Links to everything are in the description. Back to the video. Every time there's a debate as to whether The Dark Knight or The Batman is the best Batman movie, some nerd always pops up to say, actually, Mask of the Phantasm is the best one. And that's me, I'm some nerd. 
Maybe this is my bias showing, but I spent absolutely no time debating including this one on the list, even though it's also connected with a TV show. The animated series was my first exposure to Batman, so I have a lot of love for this movie. It's the kind of good that's so good, I find it hard to write about it in terms beyond, it's real good. It hooks you right from the very beginning. Shirley Walker's top-notch theme playing over the sweeping shots of Gotham City is indescribable. This is the first Batman movie that had any interest in exploring Bruce Wayne as a character in depth. What made him this way? What is the attraction? This is the story of Batman. Inventing a villain from scratch rather than using a pre-existing one from the comics is a gamble. Other superhero movies have tried it and failed miserably. But the animated series team clearly knew what they're doing in that regard. The movie creates so many pieces of Bruce Wayne's history completely whole cloth, but rather than feel like they're trying to rewrite the Batman story, it just feels like they're trying to lovingly add to the mythos. Giving Bruce Wayne a love interest who may be able to bring him back to humanity before he ever becomes Batman is an inspired decision. Even though we know for a fact they don't end up together, this movie still manages to make us root for these two broken people and hope they make it. The framing device of the World's Fair is genius. Having it be the site of their first date together, presenting it as a potential bright and happy future for them together, only to return to it later when it's been left to rot unattended and then finally goes up in flames at the end. That's called symbolism right there. And it's no mistake that the Joker is using it as his hideout and is the one who sets off the bombs. I'd like to see the Joker used like this in more Batman movies. Not as the main villain, but more an ever-present figure in the world. Here, he represents the thing eternally keeping Bruce and Andrea apart, both their unresolved traumas and the never-ending evil within Gotham. This is quite simply the most mature and thoughtful Batman movie yet. It blows everything that came before it out of the water. I'd call it underrated, but people have been calling it underrated for years. I think it's safe to call it rated now. This movie is absolutely all over the place. You know the feeling of when you were a kid and you were home from school with a fever and you watch something on TV that you barely remember but leaves you with a hazy, stomach-churning, headache-inducing feeling for years afterwards? That's what Batman Forever feels like. With the change in directors, it feels like an awkward middle ground between the Tim Burton style, the Joel Schumacher style, and a desperate desire to sell toys. And it's just too much for me. The lighting, sets, and prop work are just too fake. The story also suffers from a similar problem as Batman Returns, where things will just happen with very little setup or consequence. But it doesn't have any of the solid pacing or compelling characters that Returns had to make up for it. There are so many scenes that are just, Two-Face is doing a crime, let's go stop him. And then for no reason, Bruce decides to go to the circus and suddenly we're watching Robin's origin story. I did enjoy that this movie seemed more interested in exploring the character of Batman than the previous two live-action movies. They actually bothered giving him a no-kill policy, and one of the main conflicts is about Bruce trying to stop Dick from killing Two-Face. That message gets pretty muddy at the end, but I digress. On that subject, the villains of this movie are pretty... Not great. I like the idea of starting the movie with a pre-established dynamic between hero and villain, but Two-Face is a weird choice for that role, considering his origin story is so integral to his character. Neither of the villains are super compelling. They never felt like Two-Face or the Riddler. They just felt like generic cartoon villains. I think their only direction must have been act crazy. They barely even do their unique gimmicks. Two-Face uses a coin flip to decide whether or not to kill someone once at the beginning, and I don't remember him doing it again for the rest of the movie. Riddler too, I mean, he does tell riddles, but they barely focus on it. For the most part, he's just 90s Jim Carrey. I cannot sanction his buffoonery. Also, Tommy Lee Jones' Two-Face makeup looks awful. I liked some of Jim Carrey's Riddler costumes, but the fact that they made so many is just another aspect of the movie that screamed, WE WANT TO SELL TOYS! I don't know, I get that this movie has its fans, but it is supremely not my thing. There were scenes and moments that I liked, but it just doesn't fit together into a satisfying whole. One more thing, here's a weird thing I noticed. There's a scene where Edward Nigma walks out and announces himself as the Riddler, but then a few scenes later there's a news report where they say Gotham's citizens came up with the name Riddler? Did they forget they already wrote a scene where he got his name?
I have a very important question for you guys. What killed the dinosaurs? The answer is, of course, the Ice Age. Okay, I know this is widely viewed as not just one of the worst superhero movies ever made, but one of the worst movies, period. But I'm here to tell you, it's not that bad. It's not good, I'm not gonna try and tell you it's good, but it's not that bad. The toyetic set and costume design of Forever is still very present here, and it somehow looks cheaper despite having a bigger budget. At least the lighting is slightly less sickening, and the blue is easier on the eyes than all that green. I hate the new costume they gave Robin here. The one he had in Forever was, I think, as close to perfect as these movies can get. This one looks like a worse version of the new 52 Nightwing costume about a decade before that one even happened. I also hate the costume they gave Batgirl, and honestly I don't think she belonged in this movie at all. Her inclusion felt like an afterthought. She barely contributed anything to the story, and it all just reeked of the studio demanding they add more characters so they could sell more toys. George Clooney barely feels like he's playing Batman, he's just playing himself in this. Most of the actors are completely checked out here. The only exceptions are Michael Goh, who's always been a great Alfred, and the villains who are clearly having a great time. Uma Thurman as Poison Ivy isn't a particularly good performance, but she's clearly having a lot of fun and I'll admit that's pretty infectious. And Arnold Schwarzenegger, when he's not making a slew of non-stop ice puns, actually is kinda good as Mr. Freeze. I mentioned that the villains in Batman Forever never felt like their comic book counterparts so much as they felt like generic comic book villains. That is not the case here. This movie surprisingly captures kind of well the origin, motivation, and pathos of Mr. Freeze. And it's not just him either, I was shocked by how invested I was in the story between Bruce, Dick, and Alfred. Seeing Batman being overprotective of Robin felt very natural, and I'd be lying if I said I didn't get a little emotional when they showed Alfred being a father to Bruce. That's an aspect of these characters that they haven't really touched on yet in these movies, and I thought it was solidly represented here. Wait, 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 wait a minute. What am I saying? Did I... like... Batman and Robin? Well, no, not really. All of that stuff I mentioned is good, but it's undermined by a lot of very, very stupid stuff. I thought it was really lame that they tried to further the rift between the dynamic duo by having Robin be jealous of Batman over Poison Ivy. Like, I get that he's been hypnotized, but they had already set up a solid conflict between the two of them, so this just felt forced. Also, the tone is all over the place. The shifts from emotional character moments to late 90s toy commercials full of puns and explosions are so abrupt that they gave me whiplash. They did not mesh well at all. I will say though, there are a few jokes in this movie that I thought were actually pretty funny. There's a good movie buried somewhere in Batman and Robin, beneath the ice puns, cheap sets, and rubber nippled bat suits. That just makes it even more of a shame how much of a mess the final product turned out. But if you put a gun to my head and made me choose which movie I'd rather watch between this and Batman Forever, I'd choose Batman and Robin any day. Wait, Batman is just beginning now? Well, what the heck have I been watching for the past six movies? After the insanity of the last few films, things needed to be reined back in if Batman was going to hold the attention of mainstream audiences, and that's when Christopher Nolan entered the picture. Now you'd think a more realistic take on Gotham City and its caped crusader wouldn't sit right with me, given the massive cheesy comic book fan I am. And for a while, it didn't. I've only ever seen this movie once, several years ago, and I've been walking around ever since thinking I didn't like it. But watching it again now? No, yeah, it's great! One of my favorite things about Batman Begins is how methodical it is. It takes about an hour before Bruce ever suits up and fights crime, but I was never counting down the minutes waiting for it to happen. Every single action he takes before that moment, whether it be building his arsenal or figuring out his mission, is a crucial part of his journey and makes the moment where he finally does become Batman all the more satisfying. And speaking of that mission, you should know by now that I give extra points to any movie that devotes a lot of time to exploring Batman's motives and morality. 
I absolutely love the scene where he's contemplating killing the man who killed his parents, only to be beaten by the true problem with Gotham. Not some punk on the street, the men with all the money controlling everything from the shadows. That's when he realizes he needs to be something different. He needs to be a protector who strikes fear into his enemies, not some sort of spirit of vengeance who simply kills them. This movie gave me both my favorite Batman movie line, It's a symbol I can be incorruptible. And also my least favorite Batman movie line. I won't kill you, but I don't have to save you. Whenever I hear that line, it makes my skin crawl. Picking and choosing who he saves is so fundamentally un-Batman to me, and it's extra disappointing because this movie was doing so well up to this point. I like to believe this scene in Arkham City is a direct commentary on that one line. And that brings me to the parts of this movie I don't like quite as much. I think the insistence on making this movie look more realistic drastically hurts its aesthetic. Gotham just doesn't feel distinct. And I don't think I'm gonna get much flack for saying this, this is the worst live-action bat suit. It looks fine from a distance when he's gliding around, but when they cut to a close-up he looks like a stupid idiot. It bunches up his chin so much! I'm also not a fan of Scarecrow's costume, the mask is perfect, but that's... that's the entire costume. Another victim of the realism hammer. On that note, I don't really like the villains of Batman Begins either. Cillian Murphy puts on a great performance as Scarecrow, but making him nothing more than a lackey of Ra's al Ghul was super lame. Yes, I call him Ra's, I absolutely refuse to call him Raz. You're the daughter of Ra's al Ghul, one of the old man's worst enemies from way back. Though father's name was pronounced Ra's, not Raz. A common mistake. Damn, that clip was basically gift rap to me, I could not have asked for a better clip. Raish himself was fine, but I thought making the League of Shadows the ones responsible for Gotham's current state was a bit unnecessary. His motivations were fine the way they were originally. He also wasn't around enough in the movie to have a strong presence as the main antagonist. They probably would have been better served making Scarecrow the only villain in this one, and then saving Raish to be the big bad in the third movie of the trilogy. Would have given Scarecrow a chance to expand his motivations and make a better commentary on Batman's use of fear. Overall, I like Batman Begins a lot. I think it's a great story about Batman as a character, but a lot of the stuff surrounding him was pretty weak. I've been going back and forth whether to put it above or below Batman 89 on my rankings. In the end, even though I think Begins gives a better portrayal of Batman, 89's aesthetic, setting, and villain beat it out by just a hair. But again, I cannot stress how close these two movies are for me. Hey guys, did you know that Dark Knight is good? Are you expecting me to say something you've never heard before about the most acclaimed superhero movie of all time and one of the most iconic films of the century? Do you think I'm going to have some kind of hot take? Nah man, it's just as good as they say. I mean, I can try to blow your mind. Did you know they flipped a real truck in this scene? Did you know they blew up a real hospital in this scene? Did you know that the charges didn't go off at first and this reaction from Heath Ledger was completely improvised? That last one isn't true, but did you know that? Even stuff I didn't like so much in Batman Begins is vastly improved here. Sure, Gotham still looks way too normal and is shot in daylight too often for my liking, but the framing of this movie makes it work a lot better. The intense focus on Gotham's political and business worlds is how realism in comic book movies should be handled. What should be nothing more than boring scenes that leave us begging to get back to the superhero action end up being some of the most interesting parts of the movie. It's a shame that the perfect Batcave was another victim of the realism hammer though. The new Bat Bunker is lame. I think the villains they picked are the perfect choices for a realistic take on Batman. You don't have to cut much of anything from Joker or Two-Face to make them fit in with the world Nolan's created here. When I was a kid, it bothered me that Joker wore makeup and didn't have his skin bleached with chemicals, but I was stupid as a child. What matters to Joker is the chaos, the mystery of who he is and why he does what he does, and his joy that comes from messing with Batman. Heath Ledger captures this perfectly, and I don't think his performance will ever be matched. Again, look at me really breaking new ground by saying Heath Ledger did a good job as the Joker. I've said it before in another video, but I love that his final scheme isn't foiled by Batman beating him up and taking his detonator. It fails because he underestimated the goodness of humanity. It failed because he was wrong. I love that the poster child for dark and gritty superhero movies has such a hopeful message in it. Aaron Eckhart is also excellent as Two-Face. 
Harvey Dent's descent is perfectly executed, showing a dark side simmering beneath the surface, fueling his passionate belief in justice before it's suddenly ripped away from him and he's left with nothing more than rage to keep him going. Not only are they great performances for compelling characters, they tie into the central questions perfectly. Does Gotham need Batman? What exactly does Gotham need? Is Bruce ultimately doing more harm than good? I'd say my only issue with the movie is the ending. Both Dark Knight and Batman Begins have instances of Batman killing the villain that just rub me the wrong way. At least this movie gives more effort to justify the decision than Begins did, but any instance of Batman killing just never works for me. In my eyes, that is a line he should absolutely never cross under any circumstances. But, the fact that I've heard compelling arguments for Batman killing Two-Face in this movie that I don't totally disagree with is a testament to its quality. I guess if I had another criticism, I'd say that the bat suit, while a big improvement over the last movie, still doesn't work for me. The bat symbol on his chest just doesn't pop the way it should. But that's it as far as negatives go. This movie is damn near perfect, but you know that already, it's The Dark Knight. Also, Eric Roberts is in this movie, best known for his role as the Master in 1996's Doctor Who the Movie. I am contractually obligated to mention Doctor Who at least once per video. Like Batman Begins, this is another movie I hadn't seen in many years and didn't remember all that fondly. But unlike Batman Begins, I didn't find myself gaining a newfound appreciation for Dark Knight Rises. I liked it slightly more than I did before, but its problems are still very prevalent. More so than any other movie in this trilogy, Rises feels the most bogged down by Nolan's insistence on realism. First of all, I always hate when comic book movies do that thing where they take a character people recognize, change practically every single aspect about them to the point where they're unrecognizable, and then throw in a cute little line in order to throw a bone to fans. Sure, John Blake has elements from all the three major Robins who existed at the time this movie came out. He's a cop like Dick Grayson, he's an orphan from troubled parents like Jason Todd, and he's a detective who figured out Batman's secret identity like Tim Drake. But he's still not actually Robin, they just throw in a cute little wink like, hey we said the word Robin, does that make you happy nerds? No, no it does not make me happy. I feel similarly about Bane, or Bino as I like to call him. Don't get me wrong, as a character in this movie, completely disconnected from his comic counterpart, he's very fun to watch. Tom Hardy has an incredible presence and absolutely steals the show anytime he walks on screen. But he's not Bane. Making Bane a lackey for a bigger villain takes away like 80% of what makes the free agent comic book Bane so cool, the man who deduced Batman's identity and concocted a plan to completely break him through his own sheer genius and force of will. Here, he's a glorified mini-boss. And look, I might sound like a whiny baby by saying, why doesn't Bane use the Venom Serum to jack him up in this movie, since that may seem like a superfluous detail, but honestly, him not using Venom makes the movie less realistic. You're telling me he can lift up Batman over his head and break him over his knee without the use of super steroids? For God's sake, he punches this column like it's nothing. Also, I never understood why there was never any outrage over the casting of a white man to play a traditionally Latino character. I guess people weren't really having those conversations at the time this movie came out. Bane's ingenious master plan also hinges on a lot of dumb shit. Why did every cop in the city go into that one tunnel where he could very easily trap them? When he read that letter from Gordon about how Harvey Dent was actually a bad guy, why did everybody believe it? It's not like he had any real proof. It's like if somebody in real life got in front of a podium and said, I have a letter written by Joe Biden. It reads, I hate America. I raised the gas prices on purpose and started COVID because I hate you. And then everybody believed him and started rioting. There's pacing issues too, the entire section with Bruce in the prison drags hard. I get why they put him in there, but I feel like it would have had made more sense to keep him in Gotham and let him be treated by Alfred. He's gone for like 70% of the movie, it would have been nice to give one of the main characters of the trilogy something to do for the last film. But most egregious of all, I think this is one of the worst Batman stories of the Nolan trilogy. He starts the movie retired and in hiding, which we're told has been the case for years, but it doesn't really feel like it. Judging from his appearance, not much time has passed at all. 
John Blake says he first saw Bruce and figured out he was Batman when he was a kid, but these two look about the same age. At least put some gray in Christian Bale's hair, damn. And it feels like they've run out of things to say about Batman. They wrote the perfect thesis on the character in the last movie, and now it feels like they're just retreading old ground. Yep, he's a symbol of Gotham, alright. Yep, Bruce can't be Batman forever, alright. It may sound like I hate Dark Knight Rises, but I actually still enjoyed myself in spite of all these flaws. That's partly because, like I said, Tom Hardy's Bane is just a lot of fun to watch, and also because Nolan just understands spectacle. The plane scene, the football stadium scene, the first scene with the bat wing, the giant brawl at the end, the man just knows how to create memorable moments that stick in your brain for years after you see them. The way this movie is shot, scored, and edited really makes it feel like the climactic finale of an epic saga. So yeah, while I have a lot of problems with Rises, and it's definitely the weakest movie of the trilogy, I can't call it bad. I might even call it... fine. With the recent Batman hype going around, I've seen quite a few people on Twitter coming out and saying this movie is actually a super underrated gem and one of the best Batman movies ever. And to that I say... Glad you guys like it. This review probably isn't going to be very long since I think the Lego Batman movie is just okay. What am I gonna do, sit here and talk about how I think the funny Lego movie for babies has a simplistic view on Batman like some sort of asshole? It's cute, it's harmless, it's whatever. Some of the jokes made me laugh, but maybe I've just been in comic book fandom for too long because a lot of them are jokes I've heard a million times before. Isn't it funny that Robin doesn't wear pants? Isn't it crazy how many lame villains Batman has? On that note, this movie perpetuates the harmful stereotype that Captain Boomerang is a Batman villain when he is, in fact, a Flash villain. That is the only category in which Suicide Squad will ever be better than any other movie. If you can't tell, I am already running out of things to say about this movie. I think it starts off really strong, the big heist with all the villains is fun, and the musical number kicks ass. But then, after that, the movie just drags for me. I got the message pretty early on, Batman needs to open up and work with others. And then the movie kept telling me that message for an hour and a half. And kind of felt like they were saying that if he does work with others, he can eliminate crime in Gotham, and that kind of goes against the point of Batman, don't you think? Makes the character a lot less interesting if he actually can wipe out the nebulous concept of evil for good. But again, what does anyone gain from me criticizing the movie for children for being childish? I thought it was cool that there were Daleks, it was good to see Daleks. I'm out of things to say about Lego Batman. If you like it, cool, I'm happy for you. But if I want a bright, colorful, funny animated take on Batman, I'll watch Brave and the Bold. This one just isn't for me. If you follow me on Twitter, you'll know I made no secret about my hesitancy about this movie before its release. I saw the Riddler design that looked nothing like his comic book counterpart, I saw the trailer where it seemed like he had figured out Batman's secret identity, and a lot of my red flags were being raised. But then I watched the movie. Then I watched it again. And I can safely say this is the definitive live-action Batman movie. Uh, by the way, this section is going to include spoilers, so if you haven't seen the Batman yet, you can either skip to the conclusion or just dip out here. I won't be upset. Man, they really baited me with that trailer. Riddler didn't actually know who Batman was at all. I think Matt Reeves put that in the movie just for me. I see you, Matt. I know you saw my Superhero Secret Identities video. From the first scene of this movie, I was in love. The sheer presence Batman has, able to make such an impression before even showing up on screen, shows how well Matt Reeves understands both the mythology of Batman and how to effectively present things in movies. The scene where the Batmobile first shows up is another good example of that. I'm so glad I got to see it in a theater with quality surround sound speakers. The entire room shook when the engines roared to life. It's really amazing how well they combine the grand-scale theatricality of Batman with the grounded humanness of the character. They're able to show how sad and lonely he is without sacrificing the cool factor of being Batman. I don't think any other Batman movie has ever captured the brokenness of Bruce Wayne like this one did. Okay, no other live-action Batman movie. We still have Phantasm. I love that they're able to keep this gritty and grounded tone while still wholeheartedly embracing the comic bookiness of the source material. It's the perfect antidote to most modern superhero movies, mainly the MCU, who feel like they have to constantly turn and wink to the audience every five seconds to prove that they know this story is kinda silly. 
The Batman doesn't do that. It just presents them as natural parts of the world and you either accept it or you don't. Like the scene where Batman goes into Catwoman's apartment for the first time. She just pours herself a glass of milk. That's objectively an absurd thing to do, but they never draw attention to it. They never make a joke about it, it's just something she does. Even a small touch, like putting bat ears on the bat bike goes a long way. You wouldn't see Christopher Nolan doing that in a million years, I can tell you that much. I was also surprised by how much I enjoyed the Riddler. Like I said, leading up to release, I was hesitant about this version of the character. I felt like, what if the Riddler was the Zodiac Killer? Shtick was a little tryhard. But when the movie started, I was completely sold on him. As a character, anyway, not quite as the Riddler. He was certainly scary and a very effective villain, but I still wasn't sure I could accept him as the Riddler. But as it went on, I began to see more and more of Edward Enigma's, I refuse to call him Edward Nashton, comic book traits popping up. His ego, his obsessive compulsion, his desire to test Batman, it was all there. Like, I'm fully convinced that in the scene with Gil Coulson and the bomb collar, he would have let him live if he had answered his riddles correctly. But I think my absolute favorite aspect of the Batman is how heroic he is. Sure, the Nolan trilogy came close to this, making him more of a symbol for Gotham and actually, kind of, representing his no-kill policy. But no other live-action movie does it quite like the Batman. The scene where he holds the girl's hand as she's airlifted away made me feel emotions I didn't know a superhero movie could still make me feel. If I had one criticism, I'd say the Thomas Wayne reveal is a little muddled. Feels like they couldn't really pick a lane they wanted to drive in and as a result made that subplot sort of fall flat to me. But that's really the only thing I can point to as a substantial flaw in the film. Like I said, this is the definitive live-action Batman for me, no question, and I can't wait to see what Matt Reeves and Robert Pattinson have planned next for the series. So what have I learned from spending a month watching nothing but movies about a guy dressed as a bat punching people? The main takeaway for me was noticing how each movie influenced the next. While influence may not always be the best word, for some of these it was more like a reaction. The Adam West Batman was poking fun at the noir self-seriousness of the comics at the time. The Tim Burton movies had a darker edge to better represent the source material while still paying homage to the goofy camp of Adam West. Joel Schumacher leaned fully into cheesy campiness due to the negative reaction that the Burton movies got. Christopher Nolan then leaned hard into the opposite direction toward gritty realism due to the negative reaction that the Schumacher movies got. Even Lego Batman got in on this, lampooning the grittiness that Batman and a lot of other superhero movies had been falling into at the time and asking, can't we just have fun with this stuff anymore? And then Matt Reeves, I think, found a good middle ground with The Batman. Not perfect, but good. Gotham looks properly dark and gothic, the tone is somber and tense without being oppressively bleak, and the villains are called by their villain names. This new movie has such a reverence for both the comics and movies that came before it. The Adam West Batman is clearly such an important piece of inspiration here. All four villains from the original movie are in the Batman, and the Batmobile is clearly paying homage to the one Adam West drove. And this idea of influence extends outside the movies. The comics became more silly and cartoonish around the time the Adam West show was popular, Tim Burton heavily inspired the look and tone of Batman the Animated Series, and Grant Morrison's comic run on Batman, featuring a more realistic take on Gotham, was premiering around the same time as the Nolan trilogy was getting started. But I think the most impressive thing of all is how few of these movies are bad. Even the ones I didn't like so much had good elements, and Batman Forever is the only one I really struggled to get through. And that speaks to why Batman is such a popular and timeless character. You can shift the tone from all the way dark and gritty to all the way goofy, and not only will there still be an audience for it, but it will still be recognizable as the same world and characters. There will always be a Batman in the same way there will always be a Sherlock Holmes or a King Arthur or a Robin Hood. Something about him just speaks to us. Whether he's brooding on a rooftop or dancing the bat to sea, whether he's animated or live action. Batman's just cool. Hey, thanks for watching. I know it's been a while since I last made a video. I just haven't been feeling it lately. I started and stopped a lot of projects since I just wasn't interested in them. But I'm back now, hoping to focus on longer form stuff in the future. Anyway, if you like this video, consider subscribing. You could have seen this video 24 hours early for just a dollar on Patreon. Thanks to Slacker for editing this video, go check him out, and follow me on Twitter. Links to everything are in the description. I'll see you guys later.